Welcome back as we start another organ system. In this time, we are starting with the urinary system. Some people call it the excretory system, but we're going to stick with the urinary system or the renal system because renal is the word that means kidney. So let's start with an overview of some structures and some functions of the urinary system. And so let's start with some of the organs. Now there's only four organs in the urinary system, so that's nice. And the main organ is gonna be the kidneys and those are the ones that are going to be producing the urine. If we look at where the kidneys are, what you will notice is the right kidney is usually lower than the left kidney, and that's because you have the liver on the right side, and so the kidney cannot be as high on the right side. You also can see that the kidneys are usually somewhat protected by the ribs posteriorly. Not completely, but the upper parts of the kidneys usually are. The kidneys are also in a retroperitoneal location. So they're not intraperitoneal. They are behind the peritoneum. They sit just in front of some of your deep back muscles. Um, they are heavily protected with layers of connective tissue. Um, we've got multiple layers of adipose tissue in between. We have some fibrous um, connective tissue. And the kidney itself has a fibrous connective tissue capsule on it to protect it as well. And if we look at the kidney, you could say it's shaped like a bean, specifically a kidney bean. It's got that reddish brown color of kidney beans. And if you look on the inner curved area, this part is called the renal hilum, and it's not the only organ that has a hilum. Remember, we had a hilum in our lungs, and we have hilum in our spleen, and we have hilums in lymph nodes, and hilums in our ovaries. And what the hilum is, it lets you know where all the other structures are entering and exiting the kidneys. So the blood vessels, as well as the structures to carry urine, will enter and exit from that renal hilum portion on the medial aspect of the kidney. All right. So continuing on with the plumbing, exiting from the kidney, we are going to have ureters transporting the urine. They're about two and a half centimeters, uh, sorry, 25 centimeters long and about half of a centimeter in diameter. They are also retroperitoneal. They sit right in front of the psoas major muscle. That's the muscle that in a cow gives you your tenderloin muscle, your, uh, your tenderloin steak, sorry. Um, looking at the ureter itself, the ureter has multiple layers, just like your digestive system does, but instead of having four layers, it only has three layers. It doesn't have a submucosal layer. So it has a mucosa, which has an epithelial layer. You don't have to know the epithelium um, for this course. And deep to that, since we don't have a submucosa, we are going to have the smooth muscle layers. And just like we had in the digestive system, we're gonna have an inner circular and an outer longitudinal muscle layer. And then on the outside of this, we are going to have connective tissue. So it could be a real or connective tissue. Or in this picture, we can see that there's adipose connective tissue surrounding the ureter over here. And the ureter is not like a well where a drop of urine is just gonna go plop plop every time there's a drop of urine made. Instead, what happens is the urine collects in the kidney and then the ureters are gonna have peristalsis anytime between one to five times a minute. So every 20 to 60 seconds, you will have peristalsis along the entire length of the ureter so that urine comes down in spurts, not as a constant drip. So that takes us to the next organ of the urinary system, which is the urinary bladder. So remember, we have a gallbladder and we have a urinary bladder. So please just don't be getting in the habit of writing bladder and bladder because you need to be very specific. You're talking the urinary bladder or you're talking the gallbladder with bile. 
And just like the gallbladder temporarily stored bile, the urinary bladder will temporarily store urine. And so it has a wall with transitional epithelium that's very expandable. Remember, transitional epithelium is going to be stratified, but up here at the upper level, we have these cells, which are umbrella cells. Okay, so this is an epithelium that looks like no other. It doesn't look like cuboidal or columnar or squamous at the apical layer. Um, when we look at the musculaeus layer, what we find out is in addition to the inner circular and the outer longitudinal layer, there is an extra third layer of smooth muscle. In fact, there is so much muscle in the wall of the urinary bladder that we actually give a name to the wall of the urinary bladder. It's called the detrusor muscle, but you don't need to know that muscle name for my course for human biology. If you're taking anatomy, yes, but not for human biology. Okay. And in the bladder, we are going to have three openings. So even though you are seeing the ureters come down from above, I want you to notice the ureters are not opening into the top of the bladder. They go behind the bladder and their openings are in the bottom of the bladder. So we have three openings, one for each ureter and then one for the urethra, which is where the urine will leave the bladder. So my question to you is, why? Why isn't it coming from on top? Isn't that what you would expect? It seems counterintuitive to have it coming from the bottom because coming from the bottom, if there's urine there, it would like have to push on the urine for the urine to enter. You think that would be a bad design flaw. So stop and think about it for a second. Were you able to come up with a reason why it enters from the bottom? Well, here's my hint to you. Think about what happens overnight when you're not entering your bladder and the bladder's filling up with urine. What would happen overnight if the ureters were at the top versus at the bottom? You able to figure it out? Well, let me show you, okay. So pretend this is the ureter and this hand down here is the bladder and this hand up at the top is the kidney. And so I have the ureter going down. And then overnight as the bladder would fill up with urine, if it was going into the top of the bladder as the bladder filled up with urine, this is what would happen to the ureter. Do you see how it has a kink? And every time you would urinate, it would go down and go up and it would kink and it would kink and a kink. What happens to a hose that has a kink? Nothing can come through. So the urine actually would not be going into the bladder. The ureter, the hose would be kinked and the urine would be stuck up there and it would be ruining your kidney. You would have a condition known as hydronephrosis and you would be ruining the tissue of the kidney. So whoever designed you had a great design. At first, you don't think it's a good design because it's the bottom, but it actually prevents the kinking of the ureters from above. Okay, let's move on to the fourth and final organ. The last organ is the urethra. This is how urine passes to the outside. So I have a picture of a female with the urethra and a male with part of the urethra over here. And so the urethra extends from the urinary bladder. The opening to the outside is called the ex external urethra orifice. So it's right here on the female. On the male, it would be at the tip of the penis. So it's not on this picture, but you'll be able to see it on another picture when it comes up. So in women, the urethra is only about four centimeters long. And what that means is because it's so short, bacterial invasion is very easy, especially if you are having robust sexual activity or if you haven't trained your little daughters to wipe from front to back. If they wipe from back to front, then they are bringing bacteria from the anal region towards the urethra because 
remember urine is sterile. Okay, so we don't expect bacteria to be being there. The urine will flush out whatever bacteria are in the urethra every time you urinate. Now, when the penis is limp for men, it's going to be about 20 centimeters long. So bacteria would have a much longer pathway in order to try to give a urinary tract infection. So the external urethral orifice would be way down here in the man. But notice that the male urethra has to go to, through this organ, which is normally about the size of a walnut in, in a younger man. But as the man ages, the prostate gland enlarges. And as the urethra goes through the prostate gland, if it's enlarged, the flow through the urethra can be obstructed. And so a lot of elderly men end up having to get prostate um, operations where they can um, take out some of this prostate gland to make the urethra um, diameter back to where it should be so that urine can come out the way it should be. Um, besides going through the prostate, um, the male urethra also goes through a muscle layer here and then goes the entire length of the urethra actually has three parts to it. Um, just like the anus, um, the urethra has two sphincters. Remember when we learned about the um, Anal sphincters, the two sphincters were an internal and external where they were surrounding each other. Here in the urethra, they, we have two sphincters. They're still called the internal and the external sphincters, but they do not surround each other. So look here to see where they are. The internal sphincter is right where the urethra meets the urinary bladder. And then the external sphincter is where the urethra is going through this muscle layer at the bottom of the pelvis, there's like this muscle sling, which kind of holds up all the pelvic contact. So that's where the external sphincter is. And so we still have two sphincters and that's important for understanding how urine gets released. Um, so let's talk about that. The medical term is micturation, but you can just stick for this course with urination for voiding. And so parts of the process of urination are involuntary and parts of it are voluntary. And it's the voluntary part that we're concerned with when we are trying to potty train our two-year-olds. Okay. So the involuntary part is you do not need a full urinary bladder. All you need is about a half a cup. Okay. About this much urine in your bladder. When you have that much urine in your bladder there are sensory receptors in your bladder right here these one that are going to be activated and we're going to have somatic sensory fibers going to the spinal cord and then they go up to the brain okay as a result of those going up to the brain and most of this is going to happen in the brain stem we then are going to have a parasympathetic message come back down to the spinal cord. And remember parasympathetic, we have a long fiber followed by a short fiber. So the ganglion is actually in the wall of the urinary bladder. So the diagram is showing it right outside the wall, but in reality, it says it's in the bladder wall. It's just showing it out here. So. We have a very long presynaptic fiber, and then the postsynaptic fiber is going actually to that detrusor muscle of the urinary bladder. And what this parasympathetic muscle, what this parasympathetic message to the urinary bladder is going to cause is it's going to cause this muscle of the bladder to contract. Okay, so when the bladder is filling up, the muscle of the bladder is relaxing so the bladder can fill up. Okay, so it's stretching. Message goes up to the brain, parasympathetic message comes back down, goes to the bladder, and it tells the bladder 
time to contract. Okay. Now, the parasympathetic message also comes down to the internal urethral sphincter, which is also smooth muscle. So both of these are smooth muscle and in the bladder is telling it to contract and in the internal sphincter, it's telling it to relax. So that internal sphincter is now opening up. So do you see how already this is a lot more complicated than learning how to poop? In addition to that, we still have our external urethral sphincter, but the external sphincter is skeletal muscle. So it's under voluntary control. So it's not going to be autonomic nervous system. So it's not going to have anything to do with the parasympathetic nervous system. So it's going to be somatic motor messaging coming back down. This number eight right here is going to go to the external sphincter and have this relax. And only when we are relaxing this external sphincter is the urine going to come out. And sometimes when you're potty training the kids, they'll hold their fingers there just to help them with the concentration to keep this last sphincter. Hold it tight, hold it tight, hold it tight until they relax it. All right, so before you ask me, where's number five, six, and seven? They were further up in the diagram showing where in the brainstem things were going, but you don't need to know that for this class. So quite a bit more complicated than we had with defecation because we have to have the bladder contract in addition to having both sphincters relaxing. And remember, here we're going to have parasympathetic messages causing one set of smooth muscle. Let me show you with a different picture. When the bladder is full, the bladder muscle is relaxed. The And that smooth muscle, the internal sphincter, which is smooth muscle is contracted and the external sphincter, which is skeletal muscle is contracted. To urinate, Parasympathetic message comes down to the smooth muscle of the bladder and tells it to contract. Parasympathetic comes down to the internal sphincter, which is smooth muscle, and tells it to relax so it can come out that far. And then somatic message comes down to the external sphincter and tells that skeletal muscle to relax so the urine can come out through the external urethral opening. All right. So urine, we make about one milliliter per minute. So it's about a liter and a half per day. 95% of it is water. The other 5% are going to be electrolytes and waste products. When we look at our urine, it's normally a very light yellow. As you get dehydrated, it turns yellower and becomes more pungent and can be more into a brownish color. By the time your urine is brown or red, you kind of need to get yourself to a hospital because there is something wrong with you. And because we've already had our respiratory system and talked about smoking, I'm going to talk about smoking and how it relates to the urinary system in that it causes both kidney and bladder cancer because all those chemicals that you inhaled get processed and they sit in your urine. They get filtered in your kidney and they will sit in your bladder. And so you, if you have blood in your urine, if you have to urinate more than normal, if you have pain when you urinate, if you have pain in your back where your kidneys are or low back pain where your um, bladder is, all those are symptoms associated with kidney and bladder cancer. Notice that bladder cancer, if we take the risk for a non-smoker as being one, if you are a secondhand smoke, if you live or work with someone who smokes, your risk is about one and a half times. If you are a former smoker, your risk is double. And if you are a current smoker, no matter how much you smoke, your risk is about three and a half times normal. In addition to the risk of bladder and kidney cancers, um, 
Remember that smoking causes vasoconstriction, so it slows the blood flow to the kidney. So all the other functions that we're going to talk about for the kidney functions, all those functions are screwed up. We also talked about how it's going to cause high blood pressure, and it can affect the medications being used to treat your high blood pressure. So talking about functions of the urinary system, we're gonna get rid of metabolic waste. When we break down amino acids, one of the waste products, the nitrogens, are going to be forming a compound called urea that the kidneys get rid of. When we break down muscle, we have a breakdown product called creatinine. Notice this is not the creatine as in creatine phosphate. This is not that, this is creatinine. And then when we break down our DNA and RNA to nucleotides, we make uric acid. And we already talked about this when we talked about gout and gouty arthritis. And so our kidneys are responsible for getting rid of uric acid. Um, the kidneys are going to be responsible for maintaining water salt balance as well as acid base balance. I talk about this in a later video in more detail. Kidneys secrete hormone, erythropoietin we've already talked about, made in the kidney, travels to the red bone marrow where it stimulates the precursor cells to make our erythroblasts, to make our erythrocytes. In other words, our red blood cell production. If you have anemia or if you have a... Um, decrease oxygen carrying capacity because you're either at altitude or have abnormal hemoglobin. That's when the kidneys will start making more erythropoietin. Also makes another hormone called renin. This is not renin. Renin is R-E-N-N-I-N. -N -N. Renin is what curdles milk to make cheese. Your kidneys have nothing to do with that. Renin is made by your kidneys. I'll be showing you where that happens and talking more about that later on when I'm talking about water salt balance because renin is going to have something to do with aldosterone, which we already talked about having to do with water salt balance. So we will revisit that. And also we're going to revisit that the kidneys are where vitamin D becomes activated. If you're in the sun making the precursors of vitamin D, it becomes activated in your kidneys. Super important so that you can absorb the calcium from your diet. So if you have renal failure, you're going to have problems with your calcium homeostasis. So what I'm going to ask you to do very simple, draw and label these four organs of your urinary system because we're gonna come back and we're gonna be doing a lot of detailed drawing and labeling. So please humor me. There's a lot of parts to the kidneys. So let's start big and let's do all the labeling exercises I'm asking you to do. Thank you. I'll see you soon as we um, look in more detail at the kidney.